So it's a, he's a, he's a man all about the rod. I got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. yeah. Drock Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Drock Show, uh, where I love to draw something while talking to my guests, and I'm doing something very fun today. I just had an interviewer cancel, unfortunate or interviewee cancel, unfortunately. Uh, but it works out because Travis and I just have stumbled upon the hidden greatest love story in Magic the Gathering uh, between Nico Aris and a character named Bert, who I then called Brent. And what else did I call Brent or Bert? I think you uh, think, yeah, it was Bert. Uh, but then uh, you did call him Brett. Which I'm like, okay, you just swap the the letters yeah. around, so that's that's fine. And then it was Brent. I'm like, okay, it is now a new name. Um, I guess I could not give track kind of like the Bert. yeah the the Gideon Jura effect, mm-hmm. where he was, his name is Kithian, but he went to somewhere else. He was called Gideon, and he's like, I guess this is my name now. So for this one, um, normally when I start a Drox show recording, uh, because thumbnailing composition is really boring and can take a while, I do it ahead of time. Uh, But this is a drawing I didn't intend to do or plan ahead of time. So we're actually going to be doing the entire thing uh, start to finish now. Uh, Yeah, screw it. We'll do it live. We'll do it Um. live. (laughs) So the story, uh, I do recommend that people watch the very Kaldheim focus Kaldheim episode we just recorded. Uh, Super Kaldheim focused. Absolutely Kaldheim focused. Um, so I recommend people look at that one first uh, to get the full lore. But the abridged version of the story that Wizards of the Coast will never tell you, the greatest love story uh, in Match of the Gathering, uh, involves... Uh, our good friend Nico Aris, who is supposed to be, according to fate, the best javelinist there has ever been. Uh, the love story between Nico and the now greatest javelinist on Theros, uh, once the second greatest javelinist on Theros, when uh, when Nico returns to Theros. Yeah. What's you know? There's yeah, like, it... sorry, you go, you go, you go. I was just gonna say, um, it would be such an awkward um, arrival. But I also think that what we also talked about having them like not being able to be on the same plane. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, Bert ever awakens or uh-huh. his spark ignites, when, when Bert awakens their spark, true. This isn't this isn't just a cute because what I had in mind. We're gonna erase this composition. What I had in mind originally was uh kind of a, a composition with based on those you know those like uh twitter shipping dynamic pictures where it's like my favorite ship is blank and blank but i guess it's yeah. more of a star-crossed lover situation because uh bert to get the name right bert is too too afraid too unable like too nervous to confront his feelings for nico exactly yeah and it's um and you know what? You can use Brent because I I like the idea of the same effect happening to to Kithian, where uh, yeah. Bert goes to another plane yes. and he's like, "Yeah, my name's Bert." And they go, "Brent." He's like, "I guess so. Sure." <laughs> Bert's not a name, but Brent is. <laughs> Bert's like, "I guess I'm Brent." Now you know what? You're right. I didn't get it wrong. I was just getting into the deep lore. I forgot the deep yeah, the lore deep of lore. Brent Bert. Yeah, Brent Burt. Brent Burt Star. <laughs> and the uh, second best javelinist. Second best uh, javelinist. Though, I, I think something that we 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 didn't we didn't uh, specify because uh-huh. usually planeswalkers they have a particular magic skill, right? Uh-huh. Where Nico has their mirrors. Gideon had his like shield thing. Um, yeah. Uh, Nahiri has lithomancy, right? Like okay. Nissa has. But, Earth but here's the thing: for for Nico, it's a mirror because Nico's journey is about self identity, right? Yeah. Because Nico was fated to be the greatest javelinist. For Bert Brent, Bert Brent Star uh, was not fated to be a javelinist. He just had a passion for javelin, 
and he managed to become the second best javelinist on Theros without fate on his side, just with hard work, pure determination, javelin-based magic. Because javelins are this guy's life. Okay. So it's a, he's, a, he's a man all about the rod. I got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, great. So his ma- javelin-based magic. Javelin-based magic. Um, I, I feel like you know, I have to imagine White Red for that, right? Oh, 100%. Kind of, it very compliments uh, Nico with being blue white that way they have a bit of a collaboration and a bit of clashing in their colors which is that's what you want exactly yeah um so i imagine like he can like change the shape and size of a javelin (laughs) kind of like uh goku and oh my god the the power the power pole yeah yeah So that's that's his magic, um, and <laughs> yes. how that gets him out of tricky binds, I have no idea. Oh, so so many <laughs> ways. Uh, when uh, Brett Bert Star is cornered, or Bert, Brett Star is cornered by enemies, um, makes like a wall of javelins all all around him uh, to like fence people off, and leaves one opening so that he just fights them one at a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, when when things are going to be like two mountains are being crushed together, uh, grabs two of his strongest javelins and extends them. Um, maybe, maybe it's not just length that it can be even be width. So he just extends a javelin to be this giant bar holding the two mountains apart to let people escape. Okay. What planeswalkers do you think Bert has, uh, Bert Brent has met, met on his journeys? You know, he's probably, probably met uh Zhang Yanggu. Okay. Um who is a planeswalker uh that was introduced in a their first and only um global series decks. What are those? Uh, so I'm gonna pull them up so I don't get anything wrong. Uh so they're called the Global uh series MTG, yeah. So they are, I just wonder if I can get a good description of them. Yeah, it's a pair of Chinese market-specific Planeswalker decks. Okay. Featuring two new Planeswalkers and new cards themed around their story. Interesting. So they were two 60-card decks that were originally designed by a team of Chinese artists, writers, and folklorists to explore a, a branch of magic lore rooted in Chinese aesthetic and mythology that sounds profitable in the modern market yeah i don't so, want to be jaded because they do cultural explorations not for market it's just like because china hasn't been a big part in that in the history of the west every time people do it now i'm like it sure is interesting how everyone got a real interest in chinese culture the second they became the biggest consumer market huh yeah it's interesting yeah um yeah they were released in 2018 so, you know, um, that does yeah, sound so, like the time that that was happening. Yeah, it was real, real interesting. Uh, so the two new cards that they created were Zhang Yanggu and Mu Yangling. Um, so the story, just very briefly, Zhang, uh, the story takes place on the plain of mountains and seas, inst- inspired by the Chinese classic of mountains and seas. A compilation of mythic geography and myth. That's you know what that is um, the benefit of hiring Chinese artists is uh, if you hire uh, or folklorists if you hire people from the West to do something about Chinese myth it is only going to be Mulan and Journey to the West because that's all anybody knows. Yeah, uh, Zhang Yingyu searches for his identity, and then Mu Yangling is digging for arcane secrets that might right the wrongs of her past. Okay. So yeah. That's uh, that's where those came from. So I, I I'm gonna say that our um, Bert Brent Star um, <laughs> met those two at the very least. Okay. Um, just on on his little adventures, um, he definitely met those two. I think. Hold on. I have a. I'm 
I'm going so much faster than I usually do for draw show stuff, but so I'm hoping I'm getting any of this anatomy at all right. You got, he's got it. He's an Olympian. He's got to have the gold braces. Sorry, a dog. A dog wanted to be let oh. in because we're the only ones home. So Dogs he... will do that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, anyways. Um, yeah, he, he's met those two, and I think he has probably met... Um, we'll say Planeswalkers... Well... Probably wouldn't have met Tamio because in the timeline of magic, mm -hmm. um, Tamio has spoilers met an unfortunate <gasps> circumstance. No, is she is she trapped in something or is she dead? Because those are the two things that happen. Uh, she's not dead. So is she trapped in guess, something? Spoil well, I guess she is kind of dead. Um, so spoilers, spoiler, uh, Tamio and a Johnny. Okay. Johnny are, are, yeah, Johnny Goldmane are completed planeswalkers. What does that mean? So, um, because deviating from the, uh, uh, Bert, Brent Starr and Nico Aris love story. Yeah, we'll be um, back. Yeah, to talk about the current magic story that's happening right now. Um, so in the current magic story, we have the Phyrexian invasion. So the Phyrexians are one of the big bads of the magic universe. Yeah, they are the like zombie what robot. Would, it's what, what, what I would call like one of the four multiversal threats they've had. Exactly. So the, um, the threat of the Phyrexians has gotten a lot more severe. Before it was, okay, they're in their own hometown... Um, they're, they're in their own home plane. We're going to leave them alone. Um, they're just going to hang out right. and do their own thing. Um, so now they have figured out the ability to travel the multiverse. Was that on account of the big tree? That is now because of the big tree, because they have stolen sap from Kaldheim, mm. um, from their from the world tree, which connects all ten realms of Kaldheim. Kind of, it's the Yggdrasil of magic. Yeah. Um, it functions a little differently, but essentially, the um, so. The Phyrexians have been able to travel to multiple planes mm -hmm. to start their invasion. Now, the first, uh, they, they, for the longest time, they've been trying to figure out how to complete planeswalkers. Okay. Because they, they want to get agents that can just travel through the multiverse and oh, spread. Oh, complete you know, as in turn into Phyrexians. Yeah. Finish in the revolution. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the complete in this sense is spelled C O M P L E A T. Hmm, that's kind of fun. Yeah. And so they're completed. Uh, completed is a state of being that is described by the Phyrexians for being perfected. What? So um, someone's been dealt with in magic without being killed or trapped in an object. Yes. Unheard of. Yeah. So. We've never seen before Tamio a planeswalker ever get completed. Mm. Never happened. Um, Phyrexians had always wanted to do that. They wanted to figure out how to do it, but they have. Um, and it started in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty with Tamio's completion. Tamio was captured by Jingataxis, one of the praetors, one of the leaders of yeah. um, New Phyrexia. She to, was captured to, to represent one of the magic colors done fucked up and pushed to its limits. Yes. Um, so she was captured by Jin Gitaxis and taken to New Phyrexia and completed. Okay. Uh, 
So a lot of people were very saddened by that because it essentially means Tamio is dead, essentially. Yeah. But um, they were also saddened because, most importantly, she could have been a lot of help to Bert's coming of age story and learning about himself. One hundred percent. But instead, I think Bert met another uh, planeswalker from uh, uh, Kamigawa. Kamigawa. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's two more. There is either Kaito. Uh, I think Shizuki is his last name. Uh, but Kaito or. The Wandering Emperor. And I'm going to say you probably met the Wandering Emperor. Okay, what's the Wandering, uh, the Wandering... Emperor's deal? And and then we'll get into how that's affected Bert's journey. So the Wandering Emperor was first introduced to us um, in the set War of the Spark as just the Wanderer. Okay. That was it. No, and it was just Legendary Planeswalker. Um, Legendary Planeswalker, Wanderer. I think it's yeah, Legendary Planeswalker Wanderer. That is such and... a Japanese thing to do because of how many similarities and cross-pollinations there are between uh, old Western storytelling and uh, Samurai Age movie storytelling. So, like, it feels so right to me to have... So the wand... that... Yeah. Uh, so the whole the Wandering Emperor shtick is that she is the Emperor of Kamigawa. That's who okay. she is. The entire plane. Um, a plane. Yeah, the entire plane. Is, is she is the what emperor. A plane or is, is it is it orb is it orb shaped? Can I just call it a planet? I mean, it's kind of orb shaped. I if guess. If it's orb shaped, but... it's a planet. Yeah, uh, it's it's tough. So it doesn't really like orbit around anything, and doesn't really like. Aww. Yeah, it's a plane of existence. We'll just call it that. <laughs> Ordering me not to call it a planet. Yeah, because um, I don't think like planet is technically correct, but regardless, regardless, <laughs> regardless. Um, so her spark ignited years ago when um, the planeswalker Tezzeret came to Kamigawa in search of a certain art or a certain thing mm -hmm. um he broke in and he was about to kill the emperor uh something happened i read again i read the story at the beginning of the year yeah it's been a <laughs> while look this and... was not the one you researched for this is no this is just what we are uh, talking about so that we can make sense of bert's incredible journey and the something happened with the wanderer and her spark ignited but it ignited improperly okay like uh Tezzeret was trying to do something and her spark ignited but the thing with the reason why she's called the wandering emperor is mm. she can't control it Oops, sure. she just she... oh she's starts... like that one scp guy she's just going universe to universe no real clue how or way yeah exactly she can like she knows when it's going to happen but she and she can like hold on for as long as she can, but it tires her out, and so she Eventually just plays. She just has to go. Yeah. Um, and it's been described as almost like the multiverse <gasps> is telling her to move. Oh my god! So the reason you think that she would meet uh, Bert is because while he can planeswalk intentionally in most cases, there is a situation that he cannot. Exactly. <gasps> Oh my god. So they're kind of two birds of a feather in, in that sense. She can't be um, the emperor of her people because she's being forced all over and he can't be with the one he loves. Because he's, you know, being forced all over as well. So uh, I feel like they probably like bumped into each other and like um, met and like had tea or something and like discussed their situations and really bonded over that. Mm hmm. Oh so, my god, it's perfect. Um, I wonder if she could I, teach him how to hold on a little bit so that he can try to just have a minute. You know what? She probably does. She probably did teach him some method that she's come up with to uh, help her uh, remain in a place for longer than, you know, a day. <gasps> oh um, my fucking god. Travis. 
That's it. What? That's it. His dedication to the javelin, that being where his spark came from. This fucker is too good at throwing javelins. Fate can't have him on the same plane as Nico because he surpassed him at javelin throwing. Yeah. Yeah. He. he yep. That. That. That, that could that's be it. the reason. That's a fan theory. That's not confirmed, but that could be the reason. I mean, so there is a planeswalker that doesn't control the fate of the multiverse, but uh -huh. she monitors the fate of the multi multiverse and can have an effect on it, but really chooses not to because, yeah, like that's just that wouldn't be fate, right? That'd be like, yeah, um, and her name is Aminatu, the I think it's the fate shifter. Like she can. She has the ability to shift fates. I don't believe she actively does it a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, the fate shifter. So she's a so little girl who hangs out in a swamp. What do you, um, okay, like Shrek, but a little girl. Yeah. What What do you see uh, her role in this love story as being? You're the lore expert. I'm 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 at your whims for this one. I would say that um, if, like, the reason why um, Bert Brentstar, um, and which is now just his name, yes, absolutely, uh, has has you know has this planeswalker effect where he can't be in the same plane as Nico. Uh, it's because you know if they were to like they would be an unstoppable team. It's they too would, much for the multiverse like, to handle. Yeah. Okay. Two javelin masters, never the twine shall meet. You know, because because you know, Bert can make Nico realize something that I think would make his card too powerful. That's why he's limited, because Bert can help Nico realize that look, just because you're not you don't want to be defined by javelins, doesn't mean you need to give up on them entirely. What if you use mirrors and javelins? Nobody's stopping you. What if you had javelins coming out of your mirrors? What if? Oh no, and I, I agree. Um, I think for the safety of the multiverse, um, for the power balance <laughs> of the multiverse, uh, Nico and 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 Bert Brenstar. Bert Brenstar, yeah, <laughs> should never can't ever be in the same place for too long. The safety and the stability of the multiverse is at, is at stake. Oh my god. That's tragic. Yeah. Who would have thought javelins would be so powerful that two javelinists would be enough for the little girl who runs fate to stop these people from expressing their love that's meant to be? You know, and here's the thing. You know, we... We have never discussed Nico's. I was about to say that. We don't know where Nico yeah. stands on this. You know what? And and I want to say Nico doesn't know. <gasps> and I, I'm going to also. Does Nico not know there. about Nico's feelings, or does Nico just not know that this is an option? Does Nico not know how Bert Brentstar feels? I think, I think it's the second. I think oh. Nico clearly has no idea. And, um, and I think. Uh, Bert Brentstar is too scared to admit his feelings for Nico in fear of Nico rejecting <gasps> him. No. I'm, I'm going for a and very so, himbo vibe with this design, I think. Okay, great. I love it. Um, and so I, I think that uh, it it's not only like like literal that he can't be on the same plane mm -hmm. um or what it could be here we, we can we can pivot this plot here uh -huh. where it's not because if they got together they would be you know unstoppable okay it's part of that but it's also um it is forever Bert brent star's fate to uh he physically cannot confront Nico until he emotionally confronts himself about his own feelings and like emotionally is ready to 
tell Nico of his feelings. Oh no. So it's it's also like very symbolic of of his mental state. So tragic. Cast mm-hmm. through the multiverse, unable to be with the one he loves. Yeah. What what other planes should should uh Bert have gone to? What what would be a fun place for this oh, guy? Um Kamigawa, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I think I think Ravnica I would be a fun Ravnica. place. Ravnica. Something yeah, about Ravnica. someone from like this very like spread out mythic land coming to the city plane feels very, very interesting. No, I agree. Um I, th- I think Ravnica. I think um uh where where else? Um This is a fun place to call the multiverse. Okay, this, this picture go. takes place after uh, they're a little bit more aware of the feelings because I'm giving them a little blushies because it's cute. Great. It's um, like a real Greek nose. <laughs> I I think you could we could definitely see uh, Bert Brentstar heading to um, uh, Alara Strixhaven. Came to mind for me. Oh my Alara. god, Strixhaven's funny. Yeah. Uh, you built entire Where? academies for nothing but the purpose of writing? I do not understand. But where he becomes a little bit more knowledgeable because he meets someone from the Lorehold College. Oh, um, shit. Who, who definitely who shows him around and like shows him like different javelin artifacts and <sighs> like how there used to be like an ancient uh sports thing and then like introduces him to oh my god Strixhaven does Strixhaven, Strixhaven has yeah they have uh, campus athletics he becomes a star athlete yeah. in Quidditch I or think so too Magic or like gathering equivalent Quidditch yeah which is you capture the other team's mascot um that's is the funny thing and like he <gasps> he's a he hero from the Greece he's so good at capturing big animals yeah <laughs> Yeah, so he joins the the Lorehold team because he gets recruited. Yep. And uh, yep. I, I think I think I really do want to give him, like, yeah, sure, he's got this like love, this forlorn love. Uh-huh. But I want to give him some happiness. I want to say he meets someone <gasps> at the Lorehold, okay. and like has a, a nice fling with them for a period of time. Oh my god! Yeah. Um. And uh, like, really. Uh, like learns what what he wants in a relationship what he kind of like um kind of like learns more about himself by learning about somebody else you know that sort of yeah <laughs> sort of stick. i like um, it yeah i i think he, i feel he deserves that this character that we've made up um well this character that we've made up but is definitely canon 100 percent canon uh, he's he's obviously. been in the background, so no one's noticed him yet. But like, he's out there. He's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, like, have you seen so, the card with the Match the Gathering Quidditch Stadium on it? He's one of yes. the people on a broom, or whatever they are doing. Uh, however, they're doing things. However, they're doing what they're doing. He's he's there. He's one of the athletes. He's, yeah, he's one of the athletes. He's someone. He's someone there. Um, yeah. It's actually an Easter egg. Oh my god. The the, yeah. the this is such a Greek tragedy. And he like he goes to um uh Alara where he he meets he goes to the Naya shard. I mean they're all converged, but like he goes to, mm-hmm. to Naya and he meets like the the wild folk, and like he learns more about nature. Oh, and does he, he helps, get does like, he hunt. get a Naya color card, or is it just going to be white red? You think? He's just going to be white red. Okay. Like if he shows up in 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 like a the next set on Alara, he would just get like a white red card. Um, but but he'll be Naya aligned, sim- like how Elspeth yeah. was aligned with the one shard, even though she was still just white. Oh yeah. yeah. Um yeah, he he'd he'd be 
I mean, I, I think I would just put them in, like, for design purposes, I would just put them in red. Um, so, so, like, oh. uh, in limited, you could play him with, like, Grixis or okay. Naya. Um, or, that's it. Uh, Jund. Yeah. Um, just for a design standpoint, I would just mm -hmm. put him in, in red. Uh, but for, like... His color identity as a character, definitely white-red. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of mechanics would we give this guy? Like, uh, when I think Javeliners, I think, like, way back, that card that entered the battlefield with a Javelin token. Um, and you could tap the creature, remove a Javelin. I could see a Planeswalker having a passive ability that all creatures with a javelin token have haste and a plus one to give a creature a javelin token. Okay, I mean, I would also say very much designed like Nico. So I put X, uh, white, red, red, uh, and then it would enter the battlefield with X javelin tokens and a javelin token would have an equip cost of one. Uh, equip oh. creature gains plus one, plus oh, and haste. Okay. And then his plus one would um, uh, sacrifice an equipment, uh, or sacri yeah, sacrifice an equipment. Uh, Bert Brentstar deals three damage to target creature, so he bolts a creature oh, by just throwing wow. a javelin at it. Now, does he deal the damage, or is it? Could you make it without it being too wordy that you sacrifice a an artifact or sacrifice an equipped uh, artifact like it has to be on a creature and that creature deals the damage that you can bypass protection? Uh, the wording would have to be... Because um, I think it would just get too wordy. Uh, Otherwise, I really like that ability. Uh, sacrifice an equipment that is attached to a creature... Uh, yeah, because then you'd have to put like that creature deals no, damage. No, I think unfortunately, equal to, yeah, yeah, it's too. Hard. It's a shame because I like the flavor of that, but and I like the ability to like if you're playing with multiple colors, uh, avoid whatever color protection. But I think it's just not doable yeah. without it being very no. wordy. And so you'd make it a plus one ability. You'd 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 have him enter with three loyalty. Same thing. Yeah. Um, but you'd only be able he'd only be able to deal that damage to creatures. Mm -hmm. um, to make it like very limited, but he still has a way to protect himself. Yeah. Um, and you would just do any equipment. So like you say, you could play him for four, you tick it up, and then you bolt a creature that might be able to damage. Sacrifice a rock. Yeah, sacrifice a rock or sacrifice a, uh, maybe a javelin that came in, or maybe you have um, bone saw, which is a zero mana equipment. You would sacrifice mm. it and deal damage. I think his minus, he would have a minus one where it create a javelin token. Um, that makes sense. And then... Uh, Parallels him well he, with Nico. Uh, plus one, minus one. I think he would have probably a bigger minus. I think uh, I would say minus probably six because you'd, be, you'd have to check him up three times and then use it. Um, mm. Where you would cr uh, create x javelin tokens where x is the number of artifacts you control or you could say artifacts or creatures okay. um i'd say artifacts where that where x is the number of artifacts you control then uh burt brent star deals x damage to any target equal to the, the number of artifacts after the creation or equal to number of javelins I would say equal to the number of javelins, but I do like deals. Uh, Burt Brunster deals damage equal to any or uh, any target equal to the number of artifacts you control. Or so you could also something that could be oh god, it gets so hard to count. I like the flavor of it, but it's much harder to count if it's like um, you create a javelin for each artifact you control and then deal damage equal to the number of artifacts that came into play under your control that turn. Like yes, I, that, I like that, that conceptually. That... Yeah, that that's tough. Because um, you could either do um, with how many javelin tokens or artifact tokens you control. 
Oh, um, that could be then, interesting because then you could put them in a deck with like blood or food or whatever. Exactly. Um, definitely blood. You can put them in a blood deck. You play Doxide Extortionist, get a bunch of treasures. You alt him. You create a bunch of javelins, and then you deal a bunch of damage to something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I would I would give him that alt, or I even maybe even make it minus five, mm -hmm. uh, because you would it's it's one target it's not like it's you know it's completely game changing yeah sure you might do 15 damage to one target mm -hmm. but that's one target and i feel okay I, no can minus six makes sense because that's usually uh for 1v1 balancing issues like mm -hmm. uh you get essentially on turn four that the planeswalker is out you'll be able to deal that big damage and plus if you're taking up and um if you're ticking up and creating jab and sacrificing javelins, you're not going to be able to. Yeah. So his his plus makes his minus six weaker, mm -hmm. but um, his other two abilities of creating a javelin token and sacrificing it to deal three damage is more about board control, which is to me the white part of the card. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I see that. I like I like that concept for abilities. I I think that's. That's a cool idea, and I like the idea that this would be played in an artifact deck because I think that's yeah. kind of the a lot of the best red white decks are. Yeah, a lot of them are equipment based, so that's why his first ability just sacrifices any equipment, mm -hmm. and then, um, or you could switch where his plus one is you just create a javelin token, his minus one you sacrifice an equipment, mm. and you deal three damage to any uh, like two a creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. Um, and then his minus six is you create X javelins or X is the number of uh, artifacts you control. Then he deals X damage or X is the amount of artifact tokens you control. Uh, okay. So we have an idea of, of the, of the story of where he starts. We have an idea of color identity of the type of decks that this guy would be in. Oh man. The only thing that I think is a little bit sad about, uh, the mechanics that we'd be going for is I don't really see a way that you would ever want to put him and Nico in the same deck, but a struck, a struck star crossed lovers. So oh, I don't think that's the biggest issue because they're not supposed to be together. Well, well actually, uh, huh? if you think about it... Oh, um, you see something I don't? The magic man. Yeah. Think about it this way. His his ultimate ability counts the amount of artifact tokens you control. <gasps> right? Oh my god, And Nico you're right. creates shard tokens. You're so, right, I'm sorry. so there is a benefit. Those are enchantments. Oh god, so, no. So, never mind. Never mind. I guess you could just change it to amount of tokens you control... Non-creature tokens? To make it even... No, you just tokens, period. No, uh, you I, I was change... wondering, do you want it to be... Like, if you're designing that, do you want it to be non-creature tokens, or do you want it to be all tokens? you think all? All tokens, uh, if you made the ultimate at, like, six or seven. I feel like um, if you do non-creature, you don't really need to increase the cost much, and it becomes playable in a lot of weird, creative ways. Yeah. Because um, you could use it I so mean, much earlier, and certain yeah. would like it. Because yeah, you could you could use food and treasure. Yeah, blue, that's kind of my thought. Is non creature rock, tokens are are, -creature. are so much bigger of a um, thing the, now? Than yeah, the totally. Yeah, you could change it to non creature tokens. Because that would let them be in a deck together. Because most of the tokens you're going to get for non creature are going to be artifacts anyways. But it lets the shards be used, and it would also let um some of the cards that create land tokens be used. Yeah. Although, uh, how many of the land tokens aren't also creatures? None. I don't think oh, there are any yet. tokens that are Dang. just land, well, unless you were able to just copy some create tokens of target permanent, which there are a few cards that do yeah. that. Okay, um, so, so you'd be able to create like land tokens, but so. Um, Making it be non-creature tokens would mostly just be so that there'd be a reason to put them in a deck together. I don't hate that, though. Probably, yeah. Um, 
yeah, you, you it would be a, a cute little little nod where yeah. the other two abilities are very much just primarily focused on what uh, Burt Brentstar wants to do. Mm-hmm. And the last one is just so that look, it's not ideal, but if you want to play them together, there is a benefit you're getting. Yeah, albeit small, but there's yeah. still a benefit. And that's something. Yeah. No, I um. Okay, so now that we've done a bit of that, I I want to talk to you. Now, these, like, this stuff hasn't happened yet. Of course, everything else we've talked about so far, we've mostly talked about the stuff that has happened just in the background of the, of the Magic Universe. What do yes. We, what do we see, like, what do you see the conclusion of his story one day be? And what's, what's your theory for, for the endgame for Burt Brentstar? My theory is that uh, it's very, it's the it's a, the bad cliche of a lot of um, queer stories where <gasps> no! the where the character dies. You're doing um, the thing. Oh no, Bert! I know. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. But I just, I feel like, I mean, or. It's it's a beautiful happy ending where it's magic. Him it's not and, a happy ending. Someone's got to get killed or yeah. trapped in an item. Yeah, where him and and Nico they finally like he learns to control it. Where they're finally able to meet up, he confronts his feelings for for Nico and like just about as just as Nico is about to respond, um, uh, he. I, I don't think he should die. I think he should, he literally gets sucked away before he can hear uh, Nico's answer. Oh no! And, oh, that's um, very good. And he is he now he then for a long time decides to just stop looking and like <sighs> stop trying to find Nico and stop you know really um, focusing on that mission and kind of. He gets zipped away to Innistrad. I would say it's the best place to be depressed. And um, he just is, uh, he just joins, he stops planeswalking. Um, he, he joins the, the city of, um, wherever Thali is from. Um, I, not, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he ends up like working with the local den- the local humans of Innistrad and helping them fight off the werewolves and vampires and like he gets his own like javelin militia becomes part of the society um works with the angels of Innistrad um like becomes and see this is where if he was in Innistrad this is where he would get the Naya card uh because he starts working with Sigarda who who's that and so Sigarda is um, the host of Herons. She is the only angel in all of Innistrad who did not get corrupted by Emrakul. Oh, okay. So she was part of the, they called them like the Powerpuff Girl angels back in Innistrad, right? You had oh. Sigarda, Gisela, and Bruna. And then two of them did their meld. And then the, those two, because those two were followers of Avacyn, they kind of like started following Avacyn because Avacyn was this, you know, new hot goth girl on the block. Yeah. And Sigarda was like, <laughs> ah, guys, like I, I don't like, she's cool, I guess, but guys, she was created off. by a vampire. So I don't really trust her all that much. Um, I'm going to have my own religion over here. I'm going so, to be a Martin Luther on this side. And, uh, yeah, so she, she kind of had her own thing going on for the longest while. Uh, and then when Embercool was called to Innistrad and everything started becoming corrupted, Avacyn was corrupted, which meant everyone underneath Avacyn, all of her angels and her followers, who were angels, were corrupted by Embercool's madness. Okay. So that also meant Bruna and Gisela. And Sigarda was actually the one who blessed Thalia. Uh, oh, God, which one's Thalia? Thalia Hard to keep track of the names. Thalia is a Cathar that was a Cathar of the Avicinian, Ava, Ava, Avicinian, 
the Avacian order in Innistrad. Okay. But then uh, she did some things and was kicked out of the order. Um, hence, Heretic Cathar. Okay. Um, uh, she was kicked out of the order because she saw the things that were going on. And she's like, hey, that's not cool. And they're like, get the fuck out. She's like, okay. And so she sure, became, yeah, became a um, devout follower. Not, she became kind of a follower of, of Sigarda um, and became a guardian of Thraben again. Uh, that's why in the Innistrad set that we went to at the end of last year, okay. that's why she, Thalia did not get a new card. She got a reprint. She got um, Guardian of Thraben. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, she she became uh, the Guardian of Thraben. Uh, so I would I would say our our boy here. Um, his his you know you know hung out with Thalia, hung out with Sigarda, and if he were to get a card, I would give him this. This is where I would give him the Naya card. Because Sigarda is a green white angel, oh. right? So, uh, because he has become like this protector of humanity, um, kind of a loner. He really, that's all he does. He like makes sure everyone's okay and then like goes, does his own thing and cries himself to sleep. Oh. Um, and, um, and it's through like Sigarda's C- teachings and her guidance of like how to handle yourself and how to be a better person is where he he's willing to give it one more try. And this is like years later. Yeah. Um, he's willing can to I, go and go hunt for... Can I briefly go. go back and pitch something for when they met each other and he was able to hold on for a moment? Yes. That whatever battle they were doing, at one point, to, to be able to hit something very far away... They combined their powers and did the thing that you made up earlier that it turns out isn't real, but now it is, to use the mirrors to make a portal so that he could throw a javelin further than anyone could uh, to hit something. And, I mean, yeah, totally. I, I, that, I think ha- That happened is all I'm saying. Yeah, no, and I, I, I like it. And I think it can also already just be canon just because... Um, of the way you can you could say that um nico's uh mirrors work where um uh burt brenstar throws the spear and it the goes javelin, into the detention zone into a mirror and then he just makes another one that's an exit from that zone exactly yeah and it keeps the velocity yeah exactly. I think that's, that's the one thing that would be <laughs> that the reason why it wouldn't because it wouldn't keep any of the velocity but no it does it keeps the velocity because if the door is uh, open it keeps the velocity exactly that's that's all portal physics yeah so yeah i i feel um <clears throat> years later down the line after you know our our buddy bert has become a um naya planeswalker um learned a lot about himself did a lot of you know self-discovery and saved thousands countless lives with mm-hmm. his his effort finally like goes back to theros mm-hmm. and th- you know fate has weaved itself so nico has also found their way back to theros for some reason yeah something's going on and something's going on it's and they, a magic they... plane that sells kind of well yeah and it, and they bump into each other, and they have that look. They share. They share a stare, and something happens. Bert Brent Star doesn't feel the pull. <gasps> doesn't feel anything ripping him away, and so he walks up to Nico, and Nico walks up to to him. And they look into each other's eyes. They smile. And then they kiss. Aww. And then, yeah. And it, it like, lasts forever. It's one of those, like, 360 pan shots <laughs> um, of the, you know, the camera zooming around yep. them. Yep, no, no, I know what you're saying. 
Yeah. And so, so, and I think that's kind of where like that part of the story ends. Yeah. I, I think that works until, you know, there's a new threat and the way that magic does to make you care about a new threat, something that was good has to be ruined by it. Yeah. Like, I don't know, Eldrazi are in Theros now, so one of them's been Eldrazi'd. Uh, <laughs> sure. Look, uh, or, like, um, one of them has, uh, like, the, the Eldrazi, uh, you know, kills one of them. Um, or, uh, Nico tries to save, um, Burt Brent star by trapping him in a mirror, mm. but then the mirror gets shattered by an Eldrazi because it like it smacks Nico out of the way and he kind of loses control. And the mirror mm. shatters, but uh, Burt is nowhere to be seen. Flipping the canvas. That's pretty all right for how fast this is put together. I think your neck is weird though, my 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 friend. Um. Oh, God. Real quick as a deviation, because I just thought of this. So, Magic, we mentioned there's only been so many threats to the multiverse, right? Like, uh, Urza's yes. arrogance and f compulsion to protect has been a multiversal threat. Uh, the greed and power hungriness of Nikol Bolas, um, the Phyrexians consuming everything, the Eldrazi also doing that, but in a different way. What if you were to if you were to make something that exists in Magic the Gathering lore currently suddenly become more important to be the next big threat after the Phyrexians are dealt with? Now granted, a time portal was just opened up, so Urza's arrogance absolutely could become the next threat again. So it could just be that. So we're gonna say not that. But if you had to pick something in Magic lore to be the next like big bad after Phyrexia, what would you pick? Probably the return of Lim Duel. Okay, tell me about that because I don't know what that is. Yeah, so Lim Duel. Um, I'm just gonna pull up his wiki here just so I can be um, be be as accurate as I can. So he is a powerful necromancer who terrorized uh, Terrasser, um, which is a continent on Dominaria during the Ice Age. Lit. Uh, he fought okay. people like Jai Fowler, Joda, um, and he was one of the people who possessed the ring of Marisil. Of Marisil. Okay. Um, Marisil was this, again, an evil necromancer uh, who tried to find immortality, um, but then also, but created this ring to keep his essence alive. And, and Lim Duel, uh, I believe, was led to that uh that ring okay uh yes so he was a lowly soldier of the killed and then he was sent on a mission to kill some goblins and then the mission went horribly wrong um and Lim Duel fled while all of his compatriots were murdered uh okay. when he was when he ran away he was caught in a blizzard he nearly died but found marisil's ring and it kept him alive so you um, want to see a multiverse trotting super immortal necromancer? Yes. Um, I feel I like mean, they that would are... be good because magic hasn't really done that much with like powerful necromancer bad guy. Like weird, nope. weirdly enough, like army legions of zombies raising planes, like turning an entire plane into an undead army. You'd think that would have been done. Like it feels like a threat you'd I mean, think of with magic's lore and how it works. It it was done, but not by a necromancer. Yeah, I mean, Nico Bolas didn't go around plane to plane, though, making his undead army. He just went to one plane and was like, they have really good zombies. I'm gonna, this will be the bulk of my army. Yes, this but, will be my army. That is it. <laughs> that His entire army was just Lazotep-plated zombies from Amonkhet. But can you imagine how, oh my god, like, the cool lore you'd get of, like, a planeswalker going to a world, and it's dead. Like, yeah. And, like, they're looking around, and there's remnants of civilization. All of the graveyards are empty. No zombies yeah. are left. Like, they truly just have no idea what the fuck happened, and they plans walk around some more. And eventually they find another dead world. Completely devoid of life. All of the dead are gone. 
They don't know what the fuck happened. Clearly this world used to be alive. And eventually they come to a world being devoured by zombies that outnumber the living 10 to 1. I like it. That's so scary and cool. Holy shit. Okay, so I, I don't... I don't like my idea as much anymore because I just uh, added a pitch to yours and now I think your idea is cooler. Uh, but but when I think of magic threats, I I love Merit Lage. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll let you explain yours, but then I will mention something about Merit Lage. Okay. So the reason I, I like Merit Lage is just... Um, I, I feel like as much as I like the Eldrazi's, to me, uh, I get more of the, like, Lovecrafty and horror but a fix from something like Merit Lage, where it can, like, be entombed but not defeated, uh, a beast of impossible power slumbering under the ice ready to reemerge, sending whispers to cause cults of worship to spread across the multiverse. I just think that's so spooky and cool. No, totally. And um, I'm, I'm about to get into spoilers for the comics. Um, <gasps> oh, is Merit Lage in the comics? Yes. Ooh, okay. I'm, gl I'm glad my so, girl getting some time. Yeah, so um, a little bit of spoiler territory, but uh, so in the comics, there is a force that is taking over Ravnica. Okay. Um, and everyone thinks it's it's the Demir. The, De the Demir are plotting to take over Ravnica and set up a cult. But then uh, Lazav, who is the Demir mastermind, he's the leader of the, the, the Demir guild. You know him well. He, go yeah. um, he goes to the Gatewatch, the Planeswalkers, and he's like, so this ain't me. I hate doing this. Sorry? But this ain't me. Is I was being him. Yeah. Well, he's like he's like I don't want to do this, but I need your help. And they're like, "Oh, you're tricking us. You're gonna trap us." He's like, "No, seriously. Like something bad. I need your help. Like I would never do this, but I, like, my agents have been going missing. None of the other guilds are doing anything because it's because he's like I've got my eyes, my you know eyes and ears everywhere, and I I know what everyone's up to, and it's nobody else, and it's not us." So, mm. something's going on. And it turns out that Merit Lage is starting to escape. So, she has started putting her influence into the multiverse and an impact. And it was drawn to Ravnica because Ravnica is one of the most populated planes. So, if she's sending these whispers uh, um, out, it's going to spread there faster than anywhere else because the population density is insane. Exactly. So... Um, she yeah she sends out her uh her influence and she starts influencing the people of ravnica yeah okay so i'm glad they're doing something with it it doesn't need to be the main threat in the main universe for me to be happy i'm just happy that something that cool and lovecraftian is being used as a big threat and that's i i feel like is a really great application like they're really thinking about like what is scary about it and how people would react and i like that I mean, they've already dealt with it like the that oh, arc's okay. already over well hey look i still um, think it's cool no but yeah it, it was <laughs> super cool and the way they dealt with it is they killed off a major magic character <gasps> in in the non-canon yeah. different canon comics yes but still um, who'd they kill uh they killed jace <gasps> your so, boy uh, so they the plan was to lure Merit Lage because Merit Lage goes to what she feels has the most presence, mm -hmm. right? The plan that she feels is the most presence. Oh, so mean plan, their not plan, planning. yeah. So their plan <laughs> was to use Liliana okay. to go to Amonkhet, where there is so much dead. Yeah, uh, to call all the zombies from Amonkhet use Jace and Kaya to amplify a mind sync mm -hmm. and with with Liliana to amplify a mind sync for all of the zombies to continually think like we want Merit Lage. Like oh. that's to essentially do what Nahiri did on Innistrad, right? Yeah. To 
bring Merit Lage to Almonket. Mm-hmm. They found a way to trap her, I think. I forget how, but... Um, I mean, think, so like I every, said, things in magic get trapped in objects. Yeah, so every so as Merit Lage was being called to Almonket, everyone else disappeared, and Liliana's like, Jace, you have to go. He's like, no, I have to stay. I have to make sure that this... Uh, that this mind holds because the minute that it's gone, she leaves. And so he stayed till the very last moment, but he didn't get out in time. Aww. And so her presence just killed him. That makes uh, sense. And... Basically an elder god. Yeah. So he died, but she is now, I think they used the immortal sun. They used something to trap Merit Lage on Almonkhet to make sure her influence can't go anywhere else. I find a lot of the times the big crossover stories are some of the most clumsily done in Magic, and the individual stories of a plane are the best. But mm-hmm. when the multiversal stories work, the parts that work for me are the things that make my nerd brain happy, which is like stuff like if they if they did using the Immortal Sun to trap Merit Lage, but because it traps things from traveling between the mul- around the multiverse. I love when fantasy can take all the concepts it's built up and bring them back at a previous problem uh, as a solution. I think that stuff is some of my favorite storytelling in big fantasy. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, I think we're going to do a fairly simple color job for this one because I didn't go in with an idea and I'm making it all up on the spot. Uh, See, I take back wanting Merit Lage to be the next threat if they've already done that in the comics, because it feels like, well, you've just told a story about it being defeated. It's, you don't want to do it again. So I I agree with you. Powerful Necromancer would be cool, and I just think finding dead world after dead world would be the scariest fucking way of introducing that. Yes. Uh, Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more. I I do very much like the idea of... um, Of, like this necromancer working really like behind the scenes Mm -hmm. to um get the job done what to um oh sorry sorry you say your thing and then i'll ask a question oh no you 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 go what plane do you think if you were going to pick a plane to be like the first one that's been visited before that is being attacked by this necromancer and the undead armies. And I don't think, I think you'd have to do a thing where they can't just immediately open up the portal and let the floodgates out. Like they've got to set something up to do it. But like what plane it would be under attack from an undead horde that you think would be a good thing to like be an intense, Oh, this is the big threat for fans. Uh, the first place that jumps to my mind is Theros. Um, oh, because they already got I a would, whole afterworld. Yeah, I would say that um, the if the necromancer is able to jump plane to plane, mm-hmm. I think, um, I think that, to be an interplanar threat, they would themselves would need to be a planeswalker, or may, have yeah. been made a planeswalker. Because the yeah, character I, you wanted wasn't one at first, right? No, no, Limduel was not a planeswalker. Luckily, people well, have gained that ability so. in the past. I don't believe he, or he might have been. Hold on, um, yeah. Limduel. Oh no! So he was a planeswalker. Oh shit! It works. Yeah. So Leshrac, him, Tevizat, and Freylin. Yeah. Hmm. Because they they went to Chandelar. So let's say he shows up on our boy Bert's home turf. What happens? Yeah. I think that um, if, you know, Bert's still around, still kicking, I think he tries to... um, I think this is is the point where Bert unfortunately bites it, where he... Luckily he bites it on Theros, so he has a better chance of coming back than anywhere else. Exactly. Um, where he dies um, because he is protecting, uh, let's say, Akros, just like a city. Mm-hmm. He's protecting Akros from these horde of zombies. But these zombies are different than the zombies he's used to fighting on Innistrad. Yeah, because they mean whatever the magical creatures of all the worlds this planeswalker has walked 
turned magic or turned zombie, not turned magic. Exactly. So he's a little bit more like he's like this is weird. Like this 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 is not normal. This is not right. This is not how zombies normally are. Yeah. And just is overwhelmed in defense of the city. Has a great last stand. Yes. And then, yeah, and then perishes to a zombie. All right, I'll be right back. Oh, he's gone. Probably more dog stuff, I would imagine. I love Bert. Audience, do you love Bert? Only leave a comment if you love Bert. Uh, not if you don't. If you don't love Bert, I don't need that kind of negativity in Bert's life. What do I do about this for colors? I want to do something pretty quick. Normally I come into these Drock Show vids with a bit of an idea of what I'm going to be doing. That's why I do thumbnails first. I spend a lot of time thinking it over so that I can come up with a plan. But for this, we came in with no plan. I forgot to make a guide layer, so this tool did nothing. Okay. Audience, I'm making this up as we go. I'm going to just try some stuff. This isn't stuff I've actually done before for what I'm going to be doing with the colors. It's just something that I think will work. That's, that's all I can do at the moment. I love this tool, but I don't like that it doesn't go right up to the edge with the colors it makes. One day, Travis will return. Okay, audience, I actually like this idea I've come up with for uh, sort of pseudo fake rim lighting where I'm just using a pencil brush on this very dark purple to do all of the color information for your lad. It's, it's my... It's my biggest... Hey. Nope, well, he's back. Yeah, sorry. Just, uh, it's a very needy and old dog, so it has to be taken care of. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I'm not going to be mad at you for taking care of animals. I think I'd be setting a pretty bad example for the audience if I said, uh, talk to your friends on stream instead of taking care of animals. Yeah. Animals are secondary. Bird is forever. Yeah. Bird is forever. No, I think we, we could get uh, the community behind Bert, I think. I, I think I... so. I think Bert is 
I think Bert's a big deal. I yeah, I could I agree. unironically see a future where Bert exists, but he has a different name than Bert. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> I don't think we're going to sell wizards on the name Bert. You sure? Uh, it's pretty pretty good. <laughs> I don't like look. <laughs> now, could I see? It becoming public knowledge that this uh, stream had uh, talked about the idea of the second best uh, javelinist on Theros, uh, and Bert becomes like kind of a fan name. Absolutely, that future feels possible, especially yeah. with all of you out there doing your job, sending this, uh, telling people about the Drock show, acting like it's already a big deal. Makes all the, all the more likely that this uh, the incredible story of Bert can become real. But I just don't know if Wizards is going to name a Planeswalker Burt. Why not? Cowards. <laughs> uh. they, they tend to, like, I'm going to say fantasy-ish names. Yes. No, 100%. They very much just stick to fantasy-esque, culturally appropriative to whatever, like... <laughs> Or culturally appropriate uh -huh. uh, to wherever they are at that time. Um. There is there's something that I was thinking about with uh, in, in regards to uh, the la the the person the individual got us started on this uh, Nico, and mm -hmm. what I was thinking of is that I. So I'm I'm a progressive. I'm not going to say that I'm not. That that's where my social political values are. So I do like non-binary representation. I think it's good, and I think you close doors by not doing that for the types of stories you can tell. Uh, and it seems like they've done a pretty good job with it, where they aren't really leaning into any stereotypes, and it just kind of is an aspect of the character. But there's always this part of me that feels like. Like, there's some opportunity for cool storytelling missing in the way we often choose to go about uh, progressive and... Or socially progressive values in storytelling, which is just, like... So are you aware of the First Nations concept of two-spiritedness? Yes. Yeah. So just the idea that someone who's gender non-conforming... And every nation who has this custom, it's a little bit different from what I understand. Uh, but someone who's non-gender conforming it has two spirits. Or... Uh, a spirit that is both kinds of spirits, male and female. And people who are non-binary, non-cisgender, uh, basically, in, the, in civilizations that have concepts like this tend to be much more fulfilled than in ones that don't. So the change you're seeing in our culture now, I think, is really good um, because we don't really, until recently, we haven't really had a social custom as part of dominant Western culture for gender non-conforming people. Uh, and what seems to matter for people's life satisfaction is that there's something. There's a version of representation. But in fantasy, I feel like while it's the safer option to know you're going to do a good job, with something like magic, I always just feel like you're a little bit losing out on the fact that, like, do I think they should go to a world where people don't have any progressive values and there's no place for non-cisgender people? No, I think that's probably just... You'll, you'd end up with so many stories just being about discrimination, and I think that would sucks. But I think there could be something interesting for uh, characters arriving in a world where how they perceive the, uh, the social infrastructure for gender not conforming people is a little bit different. And is this me saying that Magic the Gathering is who should do that, and they have such a proven track record with progressive issues? The game who made white good and black evil for 15 years? Am I saying they're who should handle this? I, probably not. <laughs> I just think, like, in something that spreads universes like that, it is something that could be kind of cool, you know? Oh, totally. No, I, I feel like there is such... Um, and I think Magic... Uh, you know, dragging wizards to the mud a little bit is is, is fine and funny, but yeah. they, they've I improved a lot. They have improved, you know, over the past couple of years. I mean, there's lots more work to be done. I think mm. um, I, so, uh, some companies do it better, um, yeah. so they could definitely learn from those companies and not listen to Hasbro. But <laughs> uh, the I, I feel like the opportunity opportunities that present themselves when you open yourself up to um, non-traditional 
or sorry, non Western traditional, yeah. not traditionally Western storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really, and you do your, your due diligence and you do all the proper work and steps needed to tell those stories. Mm-hmm. Um, like for example, there was talks about, um, wizards. They've been playing with this idea for years, but they have never fully executed it because a, it hits a little bit too close to home and B, uh, they feel like they would never be able to do it perfectly right. Mm-hmm. Um, is doing a set uh, based around indigenous peoples of North America. But, like, Um, I get why they're worried about that, but also, like, if you look at uh, a group, like the group who made Coyote and Crow, uh, there are so many indigenous uh, fantasy authors who are so ready to work on a project like that that I really feel like if they just like like genuinely if they just talked to the people who made coyote and crow because so many of the people who were part of that were like uh creators of uh comic books and science fiction books and stuff like it's people who know their shit when it comes to fantasy uh if they were on board for that like keep your writing staff who know the world of magic uh but i'm positive that a bunch of the fucking nerds who worked on coyote and crow um no magic lore and like magic and would want to work on a project like that, you know? Uh, probably. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't think you're wrong. I, I think that, I know why they're um, cautious about it though. Like it does make sense because it, it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You, you go and then I'll go into that. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, like, uh, I think probably some of you, you're going to say is like, it, it is very, it's close to home, right? Yeah. It's very much like a subject that for a long time has been pretty like, you don't you, you don't really talk about it because if you do it will be a PR nightmare. Okay, hold on, this stupid dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's First Nations issues are in such an interesting place because I think it's something that people are very ready to be upset about. Uh, like uh, both both for genuine issues and for things that aren't necessarily an issue. Um, I. Uh, oh, Travis gone, right. I'm just going to say, I have seen a lot of white people react to First Nations representation without really talking to First Nations people and just assuming it's bad and that it it is probably disliked. And I think it that has ended up with First Nations people being extra non-represented because the only people willing to do anything about First Nations people at all or include them tend to be uh, people who actually have bad views and don't want to be careful and don't give a shit if they get backlash or First Nations people themselves. And like, yes, I think if you were doing something about First Nations people, they should be involved. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. But... Also, if everyone ever is afraid of doing anything that involves First Nations people all the time, you just end up with them not existing in media, and that's also bad. Yes, and I, I agree. Um, I... Yeah. For, for reference, for this I... one in particular, I am speaking from a place with a little bit more knowledge than with a lot of racial issues. I've lived on reservation, my wife is First Nations... Um, I technically am part First Nations, but because the First Nations cultures I've been part of aren't the one I have a bloodline from, it feels weird to like lean back on that at all. So I think the more important part is just I have experienced uh, Wet'suwet'en and Taltan cultures. Um, so I speak from some level of knowledge. Anyways, I just want the audience to know that. <laughs> what are you going to say, Trav? Yeah. Fair, fair enough. No, I, um, I mean, I'm speaking from a uh completely holistically uh white experience so uh it is <laughs> of course um you know I, I i agree with you i believe that um indigenous uh stories need to be told in um uh, more mainstream media because you're right if they're not told they get erased mm-hmm. uh, in, in the in the you know the the mainstream eye obviously um uh in indigenous circles, um, you know, they're really, uh, you know, they, they still exist. But mm-hmm. I, I believe in order to keep the, um, 
I guess to, to make people more empathetic, because I feel yeah. like that's something that is really lacking these days, is, is true empathy. I, um, I think it's fair. They need to be more represented, right? They, they need to be more uh, seen by the, um, I'm just going to say, it, the, the, the white culture, right? The, yeah. the, the dominant the Dominant Western culture, culture yeah. Yeah. Because I'm not even going to say white, because I, I genuinely think, like, uh, because we have an immigrant society, I think second generation Asian people, while they have a different cultural experience than a white person and are marginalized in a lot of ways, there is still they are still part of the majority of what I'd call dominant Western culture. Because uh, I, I think it's not exclusive, maybe not the most homogenous part of it, but I think every... I think basically every group who are raising it, like even First Nations people themselves are still, for the most part, at least somewhat part of dominant Western culture in interactions with groups that aren't themselves. It's just like, intersectionality is complicated. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't. And obviously, you know, um, I'm, you know, speaking for myself, I'm not an expert and you know so, social issues yeah, right? i'm not I'm, a i'm not an expert I'm, I haven't, i've taken courses, i haven't studied <laughs> that's about it like i haven't even taken courses so like a lot of this is just speaking from obviously personal experience stories that i've heard people that i mm. know um technically uh assignments that i have read that my <laughs> partner has done um <laughs> or like things that i have read that my my had to read for for school <laughs> it's she the one who is getting the degree in sociology and environmentalism uh so yeah like um i i do believe that in, indigenous stories should be told um yeah and you are right that since uh canada like modern day canada is very much uh a country in the modern world um, that is supported by immigration mm -hmm. because we ourselves, if you take immigration out of the question, we are not a self-populating country. Yeah. Um, and if, if, if we closed all of our borders for whatever reason and we waited 30 years, our population would decrease. And I, I think like another reason I really like to point out like dominant Western culture is a better term, I think, than white culture is because like sure white people benefit most from it but if you look at the united states and look at their cultural product and take away everything that black people contributed to what the fuck is left yeah i mean like, I, I feel like if you were to take everything away that they've contributed to um but i i think Unfortunately, talking about the states specifically, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that black people have contributed to the overall culture of, of the United States that the, and I'm just say the, the white people, the, the, you know, the, um, the descendants of the Europeans mm -hmm. have taken for granted or haven't really realized that, that came from like the origins yeah. of that came from black folk. Yeah. And, uh, and that goes and beyond so the things that were built with slave labor. Like, like it, yeah. it's it's also just things that were created by black people as cultural product. Like, I don't think people really give enough credit to like they don't think about the fact that rock and roll owes its origins to black artists. That originally was a part of black culture, and sure, a lot of people know that, but they don't think of it that way. And I think like. I don't know. It's cool and important to think about how much of American culture is from the uh, black subculture of America. Anyways, we've talked a lot about yeah, representation. No. I, I want to yeah. go back briefly to uh, just the idea. I think a set based off of Native American myth would be goddamn awesome, though. A like, I hope at some point they do just reach out to people like the makers of Cowdy and Crow or another group and work on that. Because holy fuck, would that be cool? Oh, I I one hundred percent agree, and I think I think they would probably. And this is just me, you know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't speak for wizards, but I think they would probably focus like if they were the, their first venture into it. They probably put a more focus on um, 
like Coast Salish uh-huh. and um, West Coast uh, indigenous uh, Absolutely. peoples. I, uh, just, just because saying. the Pacific Northwest is uh, literally where Wizards is. Yes. So I feel like they would probably be able to get the most depth of knowledge locally anyway mm-hmm. uh, if we're doing a set of based around that I'm just saying uh, if you wanted to do a set on uh, First Nations of North America the Cree could be an awesome inspiration for like a black white green because they were a conquering trade empire who were nomads and that feels black white green to me It's actually yeah. kind of funny. The Cree have such a reputation for conquest that uh, when I was living on Res in Taltan territory, and uh, they were like, "Oh, okay, so you guys are white. You're gonna sit at the guest table, uh, and cool." And then my mom mentioned, "You know, we're not really part of the culture, but we're part native." And they were like, "Oh, what what tribe?" And my mom mentioned Ojibwe, and uh, they were like, "Oh, that's awesome!" And continued to the guest table. And then my mom mentioned, well, technically Ojakri, which is a group that's part Ojibwe, uh, Ojib- Ojibwe, Ojibwe, uh, I'm not going to know how to pronounce stuff, and part Cree. And they're like, oh, Cree? And moved my mom and my sister to, like, the shit table in the corner. Mm. The, the Cree do not have a good rep with other First Nations groups. I'm not sure if that's the same everywhere, but uh, it definitely was there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Let's get back on topic. What? What do we have left to explore in the story of our boy while I'm finishing off here? Well, we've kind of talked about his beginning, his middle, his untimely end. But I do believe that um, if he were to die on Theros... Um, I feel that you could tell a really beautiful, um, essentially, uh, every culture has this story where the loved one goes down into the underworld to rescue the, their love. Right. Yep. And, and then while going up, they can't turn around. Yeah. And like, cause if they turn around, then the, the, the spell will be broken or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I feel like years, like, decades decades go by nico is heartbroken um by the loss of uh Bert brent brent star Bert and brent star. The, the most serious name ever yeah and uh they learn from crew fix who is the fix. uh green blue aligned god mm-hmm one of the minor gods but like they're the, basically the god of like constellations and mystery and like uh, scrying and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, they learn from Crufix that there is a future where they can be together. Uh, by this point, Nico is old. Not old, but like I would say probably 50s, mid 50s. And uh, they have definitely come into their own. Um, and they take the chance to go get uh they go into the underworld they they are granted passage by athreos and erebos um to complete this quest um they make a deal with erebos or whatever and when they find bert bert has no memory of them because they've been because bert's been in the underworld for so long no right and uh nico just says follow me and the 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 mindless uh because in theros when you die you become uh, you get a mask Mm -hmm. which allows you to go up to the surface so like bert was used as like athreos's um not minion but athreos's helper really Mm -hmm. um part of like a flanax group um, and, uh, you know, just, just general undead militia. And mm-hmm. when Nico finds him, grabs him by the hand and starts leading him out. And Bert doesn't protest because 
you know, uh, in this story, it'd be probably written from his perspective of like, I don't know who this person is, but I trust them. Aww. And, uh, and so leads them up. And as they're climbing up the underworld, uh, Bert is getting memories back. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure that's how that works, but, uh, that's how it works right now. It's how it works in the story Um, you're telling at this moment. Yeah. And so as they're walking up, uh, Nico has to remember to never look back. And Mm. Bert keeps, uh, as they're climbing up closer and closer, uh, Bert says things like, you know, Nico, I I want to, like, that's you, right? I want to make sure that it's you. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, Nico says no. Uh, And it's also, I think I probably would also put that Krufix says that in... Uh, in the timeline that's supposed to happen is Nico turns around. Okay. Uh, so again, fighting, fighting against fate. fate. Oh my god, that's good. Uh, so they're fighting. They're fighting fate as they're climbing up, and uh, when they're almost at, out of the underworld, Bert is screaming, "Please turn around!" Oh my god! And yeah, um, Nico can hear them. Uh, can hear him crying, and and but the the grip is still strong. Yeah. So. Um, <gasps> Nico steps out, does, does not look back. In fact, closes their eyes and steps out and pulls Bert along with them. And as they get to the very top, they turn around and Bert was never crying, has no evidence of crying, is back to the way he was, mm-hmm. but older. Um, the, the mask comes off. And, you know, just a big smile and they kind of walk off into the sunset hand in hand. And it turns out that it was Athreos and Erebos making those noises. Tricking. Bert oh, never my said, God. Well, Bert never said God, a word. They are God. Yeah, Bert never said a word. I, I like that a lot. That's that feels very mythic. Great, great storytelling, Trav. I. I really, really <laughs> like this this story we've invented. Oh my god! Um, and so yeah, they they walk off as like fifty year old people into the sunset, and they spend the rest of their days. Uh, sometimes, uh, so when Bert died, he lost his spark, so he he, uh, he can't planeswalk anymore. That makes sense. So what Nico will do is Nico will go to Bert's favorite places and come back with souvenirs. Aww. Um, and, uh, like, for example, he, or so they, uh, go to, uh, Innistrad, meet with, you know, Bert's old crew, get all of them to write, uh, write him a note, and then go back to Theros and, like, give Bert this note of, like, the Innistradians thanking Bert and, like, you know, hoping Aww. that he's well and so on and so forth. That's that's actually very sweet. That's fantastic. I love I love that as an ending that there gets to be all this, all of the people that he's helped from all the planes getting to thank him. Mm-hmm. Man, that's what a great story. Wonder what happened to that planeswalking witch that uh, that killed him. Yeah, I, I guess I feel dealt like with. that. Yeah, I feel like that story probably ended with. Um, I mean, that is kind of thing that that modern magic story is leading to. That like Lim Duel will come back because Lim Duel was is this being called the Raven Man, mm-hmm. which has always been influencing and like talking to Liliana. Oh, okay. Man, there are so many powerful entities reaching out to that girl all the time, huh? Oh, yes. She cannot get she... a fucking break. No, she is the most powerful uh, necromancer, like, potentially the most powerful necromancer in the multiverse. So. Oh, I just had a cool idea for something to do here. Okay, Trav, are are you watching the stream? Um, I was. It's it's on Twitch, yeah. Yeah. Or is it on? It's on Twitch. 
I was, but then I closed it That's because Twitch. it wasn't. That's twitch.tv. Did they do Slash? Did they do... It's Dracho. <laughs> Search up the Dracho. <laughs> Everybody. I, I, Come watch on Twitch. Come watch live. Oh, I see. Be here. We're going to be... A, I haven't oh, yeah. actually fully launched yet, but we. I'm going to... Possibly soon. I don't want to say this week because every time I've said that, something's come up to stop me from being able to. But at some point, I'm going to. <laughs> so please, please, uh, come hang out on stream. Yeah. So this is this is what I've got going, and I, I like this. I like I like the the style that I've made up here. Uh, but I have a plan that I want you to be part a party for that's coming up pretty quick here. Okay. An idea that I had, and I think I like yours better, but I do want to say what I was thinking, was doing a Davy Jones sort of thing where uh, they decide in the Undead Invasion to let Bert be allowed to rise from the dead and continue to fight. Uh, but it binds him to the plane forever. Uh, like I don't terribly hate that idea. Um, I, I like the 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 idea of um, like yeah servitude that uh, it binds him to the underworld for forever, mm -hmm. um, and then later Nico learns up a way to bring him back. Yeah. And then once he dies of old age, um, his soul will just belong to Erebos or Athreos. Mm -hmm. Or I guess both of their souls. Um, yeah. That's the deal that's made. Oh, I, don't, I like that idea. I like, I like the idea of consequences, but also they get, they get their love story to work together. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. It feels very Greek to me. It feels very much like, like a, that's kind of like Greek's storytelling is that yeah. you get your pleasures in life. And if you want any more, you have to you have to make a deal for them. Mm -hmm. Almost like beg the gods to let you do it. All right. So I'm just going to get this belt colored quickly and then uh Check out check out the cool stunt we're gonna do to uh, make this last little bit. Okay, take take a copy of that. No. Paste it. Wait, not paste it because I gotta get these layers unsorted again. Okay, okay. We're working on the background now, right? You with me? Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna go for a silvery purple here. Silvery purple for this big old mirror shape. These are the shapes of uh, their mirrors, and I find it such a strange thing, but it's very specific, which is what you want. You want something to feel, like, thematic and specific and interesting. Hopefully. Okay. Fuck. What did I... Right, I grabbed the line art, too, so I gotta do some fixes. Just give me a second. <laughs> We're getting there. Okay. 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 Oh. Accidentally working on the size of one. I think this is a genuinely compelling romance we've stumbled across between the invented character Bert, the second best javelinist on Theros. Yeah. And the canonical planeswalker. I feel like Nico. Wizards should just hire us to uh, write this story. Absolutely. And, uh, Why haven't they already? Yeah. They should have. They should. Yeah. We, I should send this straight to Wizards HQ. Yeah. And say hire us um, right now. A hundred percent. Just put us both in a room. Give us some characters. We'll come up with the best stories you've ever heard in your life. 
Uh-huh. Uh, you may you may have to change the names, but you, you know, will uh, almost certainly have to change the names. Uh, I think that's the, you know, uh, for for tabletop role playing games. I think that's literally my biggest struggle is names. Yeah. Um, because I look at fantasy names, I'm like, I hate all of these. But then when I try to come up with my own name on the spot, I go, uh, their name's Bob. They're like Bob, really? Like, yeah. Bob. Short for. Bobbert. Like Bobbert? Yep. Not Robert. No. Bobbert the hero. Uh, Bobbert is a uh, a heroic name, though, for what it's worth. Yeah, very very heroic. Man, it's rough as fuck, but I actually love this coloring style that I just did completely on impulse, not thinking about it. You know, it's, it's nice. Because it was entirely unplanned, but I really do like it. Okay, what? I think we're almost. I think I'm almost done here. Trav, are there any, are there any tidbits uh, you wanna you wanna give me? And any th- any extra info you wanna end up end with? for our amazing uh, love story slash briefly talking about representation slash uh, talking about threats of the magic multiverse. Uh, um, I guess nothing really um, other than... Um, Yeah, no, I guess it's not, nothing really other than nothing. we've come up with a, an, an amazing love story that uh, only we and everyone watching will know. Um, and so if, you know, if it so happens that it's a love story that comes to comes to being, I uh, you heard it here first. You did. And and if you didn't hear it here for uh, hear it here first, you know that somebody did. Yeah. And yeah. that's why and, it exists. Uh... And you know what? Uh, if you ever... Now, don't pressure people with a wave on Twitter. Uh, that's mean. It's rude. People have lives and jobs to do. But uh, if you ever, like, find yourself in an elevator with an executive um, and you're thinking, wow, an executive at Wizards, should I... Sh- is this my chance to pitch... Uh, my writing chops, you say, no, no, this is a time to ask, hey, are you going to make Brent, the uh, uh, Burt Brent Star canon? Yeah. I just need, the people need to know, um, please, if you could help answer the question. Yeah. Because the people do need to know, the people being <laughs> me and Travis. We really do. We really, really need to know that this is uh, going exactly the way we want. Yeah. And, uh... Okay, I think I'm just going to add some shine. So, uh, while I'm doing that, I mean, we're going to close out here, and I'm going to say, I had such a great time t- talking to Travis about our amazing invented character. Uh, I had an absolute blast. I, I love talking about magic. I think it's such a silly and dumb while also being smart and fun and interesting franchise i think it's great that it really is all of that uh and i hope all of you had as much fun as i did watching this i I also i went into this with less of a plan than i ever have on the drawing show before so if you enjoyed the drawing if you enjoyed the conversation please let me know this was all last minute and if you'd like more off the cuff rambling about made up characters and whatever comes up say so in the comments please do so please like subscribe hit a bell perform the eldritch ritual of i like this youtube channel and all the rest travis where can they find you uh they can find me on twitter at chitman 7 which i need to plug more and <laughs> uh also find me on commander's herald where i write uh specifically the cut series article where i give challenges to uh magic deck builders and they build some fantastic decks and you get to vote on which one you like the best so that's fun hell yes well i 
think that about does it for today on the Drock Show. Everybody have yourselves a great day. Hope you enjoyed yourself. I'll see you around on the next one. Bye. Brent, he's like, I guess so. <laughs> sure. <laughs>